Okay. I have, uh, as you know, next Monday is your final exam. And you'll be here on time at 4 o'clock. Please sit down. Uh, are you sitting down? Well, sit over here in the third row. There's plenty of seats in the third row, a second row. Move over so they'll move in. Make it easy for each other. That's better. Very good. Okay. The announcement I wanted to make is that uh, uh, you, you received the uh, uh, talk of uh, Bud Kunheim of Nicole Miller, right? Copies of it. And you received the uh, news that you have to get all your field trips in by Wednesday. And next uh, Monday is your final exam. And then after that, we have a special uh, program, which was requested by the Dean of Art and Design. Uh, it's a presentation by Fashion Service Network. You've got your list. Everyone have their guest speaker list? And that will be the final, December 8th. And December 1st, as I said, is your final exam. Multiple, uh, uh, 20 questions, multiple choice on the talk you've uh, experienced this entire uh, semester of famous guest speakers. And uh, I will now proceed to give you a very brief introduction of our special guest today, Ms. Eva Jambart Lorenzotti. She was raised and educated in Switzerland. She earned her bachelor's degree from Barnard, and she joined Lazar Frères, which is a very well-known, successful investment analyst. Uh, she was an analyst for them. After two years, she decided to position her future as an entrepreneur in luxury brands, where there was a need for direct consumer contact. And what I'm trying, uh, what, uh, her purpose here is to show you that there's always a way of uh, researching, investigating, and learning what is missing for you to be inventive, creative, and uh, forward-looking. And I feel that uh, Ms. Lorenzotti is one of the most successful in really zeroing in on an area which was totally void. And she's made a tremendous success of it. And, I'm not, and she gave birth to the first luxury catalog called Vivre. And now I'm going to ask Ms. Lorenzotti to take me away from this podium and I don't want to be a scolding teacher telling them to move down. Okay? Thank you so much for being here. Can I see if we can? Can you hear me? Is that okay? It's such a pleasure to um, be here with you today. Um, you know, it's really funny because there's so many things that I kind of want to tell you about when it all started and how it all started and some of the thoughts and some of the ideas, and I will tell you all of this, but I was actually thinking on the way here, I just had a lunch with this amazing woman um, who's in the, in the retail business, and um, I could feel the panic in her voice as we had lunch because she actually wasn't able, I'm going to take this off for a second. Here we go. She actually wasn't able to, um, to eat anything as she spoke for two hours straight. And I was thinking, you know, if I was sitting in this auditorium today and somebody was talking to me about their business, would I really want to hear about their business or would I want to hear about what's going on today? What are the opportunities? What are the challenges? So I kind of just sat back and said, well, maybe what I should tell you about is, you know, that this is a time of opportunity, that it's obviously a time of change. And, um, and big change. And I think that, you know, very often people talk about change um, and for the sake of changing. And I've never been a big fan of that because 
what you know sometimes is much better than what you don't know, but what you can create is, very, uh, is often very interesting. So if you think about it today and you think about the landscape and you kind of look back and you think, why are so many things not working? And I think this is going to go back to something that I believe very much about. And I think one of the reasons that some, so many things are not working, apart from the fact that there is true you know, economic distress, but I'm not going to focus on that right now. I'm going to focus on the industry that we're talking about, which is consumer, retail, luxury, fashion, all of these things, is because I think what's been missing in the last few years because of the extreme growth is point of view real point of view, real point of differentiation, real passion, real um, consumer respect, and a real idea for why people could be interested in buying things, for why people can be inspired, for why people can still desire things. Um, and I think now more than ever, that meaning, that, that point of view that nobody else may see, that nobody else may believe in, that nobody else may understand, is probably more relevant than others. I mean, does anybody really need another black sweater? Really? I mean, I, you know, I mean, a black sweater is a black sweater, but does anybody really need another black sweater? And I mean, I don't mean to make it sound like that, but I believe that this over-massification of everything, this overabundance at every single price point, at every single ability. You know, many years ago, accessing things was extremely difficult. Today, accessing things is extremely easy if you know what it is that you want. But the point is that many people don't know what they want today. And so, but if you do, you can access it and you can have it at every single price point, at every single thing. So what is going to be the big idea? What is going to be the next big thoughts? What is going to be the next big trends? What is it that as um, people, as human beings, as moving forward, what is it we want to create to enliven what it is that we do? You know, it's very funny because when I mean, people ask me, you know, what is your business compared to? And I used to say Starbucks. And actually, I still say Starbucks. And they look at me and they're like, um, which part of her answer do we not understand? And I'll tell you why. I'll, it's not because Starbucks is selling coffee, because obviously it has nothing to do with what I'm doing. But what it has to do with is the idea that you're able to change consumer behavior. Before Starbucks existed, people used to drink, you know, coffee. Coffee was just like, you just drink coffee. You go to Dunkin' Donuts, you pay 50 cents, or you go to your local guy and you pay whatever it is. Then all of a sudden, Starbucks became a culture. People went to Starbucks. They weren't even talking to you about the fact that they're getting a frappuccino, cappuccino, $6, $7. They were going to Starbucks. They changed. It became a way of life. Um, and I think that that's really what what's begins to be interesting is when you can actually affect the way people do things. And if you go back in fashion and you look at it and you think what has been really iconic, what has been really special, what has been really special are things that have survived time because they've been created with such a point of view. And I guess the reason I'm saying all this is because I think now more than ever, point of view, differentiation, opinions, risk, thinking out of the box, and knowing that without, you know, knowing that you may not know all the answers, and that's okay, because experience is the word for the mistakes we survive. I've got a lot of that, <laughs> mistakes. Um, is what's really going to count, is what is really going to count. You know, the idea of a few years ago when everybody would be sitting here and they would talk to you about speed to market, you know, how big can you get, how fast, you know, how cheap can you make it, how fast can you distribute it. I think that whole moment has just flipped. So as I look at you in the room today, I think, what a, what a time of opportunity. What a time to be able to take a moment and sit back and say, what can I create? What can I do? What do I want to do? How do I want to inspire to really make a difference? Because today, you actually can. Um, so that was my little sort of thought, which leads to, uh, which will lead right into what I sort of did, um, having been, I've been brought up in Europe and my dream was to come to the U.S. and I came to the U.S. and then of course my dream was I don't want to leave. So um, I had to go and get the right job and at the time I thought the only absolutely right job I could get was to go into investment banking. So I went to investment banking in New York at Lazard Frere which was, I have to say, one of the greatest experiences of my life because I really learned what the impossible mission of uh, working like mad is all about. Um, 
And when I was here, since I was brought up in Europe, I never was really exposed to the catalog business. And so for me, catalogs were a very foreign concept. At the same time, having been brought up in Europe, I was very exposed to luxury and luxury brands. And, and I found that when I was starting this, luxury brands were not where they were today. And catalogs were something very foreign to it. So not knowing much, because I do believe that ignorance is a, is a um, highly valuable asset because when you don't know, you do. And so there's always, so a side note is there's always 99 reasons not to do something and one to do it. I suggest you take the one to do it if you're passionate about it. So I was very ignorant and that ignorance allowed me to jump in and believe that I could create a catalog that would distribute, explain luxury goods right into the homes of the American consumers. Um, it was a crazy idea because if uh, anybody knows anything about the catalog industry, still today, maybe it's changed a little bit today, the catalog industry is really uh, about the number of SKUs on a page, square inch analysis, you know, repeat product, how cheap your paper is, how much it costs to put it in the mail, how big your distribution can be, and doing the same thing over and over again and being known to be a perfectionist in the item business. What I was trying to do was to sell dreams, to sell ideas, to explain, to print on expensive paper, to get luxury brands that don't even believe that they should be sitting next to each other on the same stage or on the same row or same dinner table to actually be part of this world. So for many years, um, I got rejection from both the industry by saying, you know, please don't call us anymore. We do not do catalogs. And from the catalogers saying, you know, you really don't know what you're doing this is an impossible model and you should go home. So this leads me to what I believe are the, let me see if I can get this right, the, the most important things in, um, in life and in a business and it's what I call my four P's to success, which then if you do these you might get the fifth P which is profit. Um, passion, people, perseverance and patience. Without passion, you're not gonna get through it because let me tell you, it is hard. And when you're passionate about something, you've got something in you that nobody else can quite have. It's like that magic formula that somebody just doesn't know how it's built. It's that ability to wake up the next day when you think that you can't do it again and start all over again. It's the ability to run that extra mile to create something which is really unique. It's all of, all of what's necessary and what passion brings, and I was talking to somebody about it last week, is soul. A brand with soul, an idea with soul, is a completely different concept because it's imagined. It's imagined and it's not walking into a room with walls and things hanging. It has a personality, it can talk to you, it can give you a state of mind, it can be defended. It has criteria, it has all the DNA that each of us are made out of because we each have a lot of soul. So I think the number one most important thing is passion. The second is people the people you surround yourself with, the people you meet. Never forget that you may meet somebody one day that you might think, well, what does that have to do with my life? And suddenly, out of nowhere, three years later, four years later, they'll be that person that'll unlock that door. People are probably some of the most important things, whether they're advisors, whether they're helpers, whether they're gonna unlock a key, whether they're going to work with you, whether they're gonna work for you. It's what makes great businesses, it's what makes great people. It's that synergy, it's those ideas. Alone, not much can be achieved. Together, a lot can. And I just think, when I think about it, I don't even think about you know, the people who, of course, people who work with me in my company are my most important thing. But I also think about, over the years, the privilege I've had to be able to cultivate and nurture and believe in people and ask for their advice and listen to what they say and make those people um, close to me because it has been a very important thing in my opportunities, in my luck, in my timing, and so many things have happened that way. Perseverance, you're gonna need a lot of it. A lot of it because if you don't persevere, it just won't happen. It won't happen. I mean, you can get lucky and maybe, um, you know, a couple of you in this room will have that lucky stroke. You'll just create that one thing and it'll hit. But luck is something that you gain. Luck is not something you work on. So if you want to get lucky, you should persevere so that luck can come. But I believe that perseverance is extremely important and patience, which I have none of. You may have a fantastic idea and it's just about, 
you know, cultivating it enough. There's a fantastic book, which I don't know if you guys have read, it's called The Tipping Point. And actually a new, uh, a new one just came in by the same author, and I was starting to read it this weekend, called Outliers, which is pretty interesting too. But um, The Tipping Point basically talks about the buildup of what it takes for something to become interesting, for something to catch on. And sometimes that ability for it to catch on means that other people haven't caught on. So what you're seeing, other people don't see. So, you know, when you think about the idea that, you know, uh, Howard Schultz of Starbucks almost went bankrupt three times, literally, about to shut down from a Friday to a Monday, and now it's got one of the most interesting companies, that Ralph Lauren's company went bankrupt three times, that, you know, these people, I mean, these are just small examples, and the examples are more and more. You see this vision, but people haven't caught on, and that's what makes it unique. That's what makes it great. That's what makes it different. That's what makes it special. So you need to be patient. You need to be patient to understand that maybe you're moving fast and things aren't moving as fast and, that, and that's why you need to keep the passion because without the passion, the patience is gonna go. So to me, these have been four sort of key elements that have really um, helped me through and continue to help me through the, um, oops, sorry, the um, situation of what it is to believe in something, what it is to build something, what it is to change something. So if we look at the luxury market or the fashion industry, it's a huge market. It's been growing. And I would say in the last 10 years, it's changed enormously. And, um, and I would say in the last two years, it's changed even more enormously. And uh, um, what has happened? You've had, you know, a consolidation that's gone on from being a very independent business where you would have essentially family businesses, mom and pops, um, individuals into three or four or five major groups, you know, owning most of the distribution. Um, that added to the fact that, you know, you've had the internet business is now a way of life, it is a culture, it is a state of mind, and then the big box retailers that have gotten very quick, very smart. So what's happened is you actually have this, this big bubble which has changed what consumers expect, which means that they want more, they expect more, they want more all the time, they want more at different prices, at different ideas, at different places. And what does that mean about getting to market? How do you, how can you manage to actually get some share of market? How can you manage to get attention? How can you create something that now makes a difference, that people notice? Um, so the environment has, has gives us a lot of opportunities because the market now is so fervent and so ready and so accepting and so accessible, yet the competition is so big that the idea is how, do you, how are you able to penetrate it? And it's really funny because when you look at what has happened to the luxury industry, in the last 10 years and what's happening to the luxury industry in the last three months, you can understand how quickly something can build and how quickly it can crumble, right? But in the reality of it is, is I don't particularly like the word luxury. I've, I've used it here because I need to explain the category. But to me, it's been a word that doesn't signify much and probably because it's been overused, probably because it's overused and overabused. And um, my feeling is that what we need to talk about, which is the, the concept behind Vive, which is what this brand is all about, it's not about luxury, it's about back to the future. And back to the future to me is authenticity, craftsmanship, ideas, people, places, handwork, stories, why, I, everything that creates context. And to the future, why? Because it has to be relevant. And that stage of relevance is immediate and very fast because we're constantly changing, we're constantly evolving, we're constantly moving. So what's relevant to us today may not be relevant to us tomorrow, hence what's just happening in the world today. What was relevant six months ago is no longer relevant today. So I think that importance of understanding what it is that creates uniqueness, what it is that creates fantastic ideas, what it is that creates fantastic products and making them relevant is really what Vive is about and what I've built this company on. And so those are just the concepts that I think are very um, important to think about and whether or not they make sense. 
What's also happened, so not only do you have this growing, growing, growing market, which has now changed, um, you also have a very new customer. And the customer today is um, no longer ready to necessarily bow down to you and expects to be bowed down to. So now what we have is we have the reverse of the paradigm. The power is all in the hands of the customer. The customer decides. The customer has the power to make you, to choose you. Even if you look, forgetting about the customer side, but you look at what's going on online, and I know all of you online, everybody's talking about all of this um, communication, which is actually being induced, created by people online. They are making brands, they're breaking brands, they're making ideas, they're breaking ideas, they're making news, they're changing news. So perception is now being driven by your point of view, by the consumer's point of view. And what that means is how do you appeal to them? How do you get them to change their mind? How do you reach out to them? And in some ways today, it's, it's, there's so many things about it that make it so much easier and in so many other ways, it is so much more difficult because there's just so much. There's just so much. So, growing market. What I want to say also is when you think about the customer, I think that for, for, it's extremely important to think about the idea that the world is no longer a local world but a global world. And whether we want to believe that or not, I, you know, it, yes, it's easier to start regionally because you have to start somewhere. It's just the way life is. But the idea is today the manufacturing is here, the production is there, the technology is there, people communicate back and forth, you could have designers anywhere doing things, you could get your stuff overnight. The way the world is moving is it's moving into a global world. So when you think about a customer, you should think about it through a different perspective and a different point of view as opposed to just thinking about it within your own radius. Um, even though I'm not saying that that's not a place to start. So this goes back to what I was just saying before. Um, consumers rule. But more importantly, I think what happens in, in this is um, the idea that there needs to be a point of view and that point of view needs to create enlightenment for the consumers. Today, if you look at every single industry and if you look at the brands that are successful, if you look at the people that are successful, the people who actually are clearing the clutter for their customers. It's, you know, Oprah who goes up there and takes a point of view. It's, you know, every single person that has, they we want to believe in something. They want to believe in you. They want to believe in what you're saying. They want you to do the work. They want you to do the editing. They want you to clarify it for them. Because if it's them who have to choose, it's just too much. And in the end, what actually really happens is what we've forgotten is that in the business that we're in, and when I talk about the business that we're in, I'm general because I don't know what each of you want to do, but I'm talking about the business of creating ideas, things, amazing fashion for consumers, for the world. Um, we need to remember that there is this aspect of falling in love. There is this aspect of seduction. There is this aspect of, I have to have this. There is this aspect of all of this. That need is not that big part of the equation and as we go forward, need is going to become a lot less a part of that equation. Maybe need was very much an equation of the 90s because there was the need to keep up with the Jones, there was the need to have three houses when you only lived in one, there was a need to have an SUV when you could only, when you never drove off road, there was a need to have a huge kitchen even though you didn't cook. That need has now disappeared and we're going back to sort of, going back to fundamentals which create great products and great brands and great ideas, which is desire. Um, and I think that desire will be created when you can curate, when you can edit, when you can give your point of view, when people know why they're coming to you, when people know why they're finding you, when people know all of these things. So what does this all mean and where did it all start? So I'm going to take a step back now and maybe talk to you a little bit about my business and then sort of show you how everything kind of connects. But um, so I started off by saying how I started in the business. And um, so this was my idea. And it was extremely difficult at the time to, to, to get through it. 
And in 1998, uh, I got hired by American Express to create their luxury catalogs for them. So about, for about four or five years, um, we created all of the luxury catalogs for American Express. So that was, when we talked before about people and luck, that was an exact demonstration of people and luck. It was a person I met at a dinner party who told me they were consulting for American Express and they were re-strategizing their position and luck because I got the job and I'd been in business for about a year and really didn't know what I was doing. So that's where the two things connected. Um, so we did that for five years, which was you know, really incredible because they were effectively our catalogs repackaged for American Express. And then we had, then 2001 came, I don't know if you remember 2001, but the world kind of changed then. It was the internet bubble, it was, everything was falling apart and um, American Express laid off a lot of people. And that's when we merged with a dot com and our business became both online and offline. Now at the time, everybody thought that the internet was going to take over the world and that catalogs were going to go extinct. Um, the reality of it and the biggest thing I think that we go back to and why I say the most important thing is who's your customer? What are you creating? Who are you creating it for? Consumer behavior hadn't changed. So yes, the internet was going to be great because it is today and it will be and it'll be ever growing. But at the time, the consumer was not ready for it. They weren't ready to make the shift. So whoever was getting online, whoever was building that, needed to understand that that would be a building process. So we joined forces in 2001 and I think that where my business really changed and where it began, it began to make a big difference for me was about in 2003 or I'd say even 2004, where I really realized that I was not going to be a brand-driven business. I was not really going to focus on, you know, the brands I represented or the brands I worked with, even though I loved the artists and I had to believe in the artists and I had to believe in the passion, but I was really going to be there for the customer. And the point of view for the customer was the people, places, and things that inspire us now, the idea of a life of collecting, the idea of out-of-the-box things, the idea of bringing a global world into a local world, the idea of beautiful design, extravagant things, simple things, the idea of the mix, and the idea of the storytelling, and more of the context than the context, more the ideas that drove things versus just the product themselves, um, even though on every pages of our book everything is so curated and so edited that I can almost talk to you about everything that's on there, even if it's a silly little softball that has an embroidered love on it, or if it's like my favorite ring, which I'm not wearing today, which is this plastic lucite hand-carved ring, which I call my magic ring. Why? Because it's light. It goes with everything. You can travel with it, et cetera, et cetera. And it's hand-carved by Patricia von Muslin, who's an amazing jewelry designer and etched, and it's $200. So that versus all of the extreme, I think what it's really about is the creativity, the design, the passion, and all of that, and thinking about creating that trip, creating that mission, creating that desire for the customer, as opposed to thinking about creating a platform for the brands. And when that happened, many, many things in my business changed, and I think many things in our approach changed. We started to create products. We, we launched a new title called V Voyager that talks about uh, not just product, but ideas places, things, that has an editorial perspective to it. Our site has become much more editorial in its ideas. We opened our first store in the Bahamas. We say, why the Bahamas? An opportunity came up for us to open a store in the Bahamas, and I always thought, if Vive could be a store, what would it look like? Would people recognize it? What would, people, what would it feel like? So my simple answer was, if it fails, nobody needs to know it's in the Bahamas, and if it succeeds, I have learned a lot. So we opened this great store in the Bahamas, which was you know, a fantastic experience. We've done a lot of television. We have um, created an enormous amount of product recently with our own philosophy. And we're going global. So the idea of a catalog business has disappeared from our language. Vive today is a brand. It's a brand about individuality. It's a brand about your individuality. It's a brand about people craftsmanship, ideas, things. Um, the way it's distributed really doesn't really matter. I mean, whether it's on this paper or whether it's um, on the internet or whether it's in a store 
or whether it could be at your next hotel. Um, the idea is what is the right way for something like this to happen? What is the right process for it to happen? And I think that when I look at today and I sort of think about the future, I think to myself, it's funny how coming out of a luxury idea before the world changed, it not being so much about luxury, even though the price points in here are high and are mixed, but that's not fundamental to the brand. That's not so important. What is it really about? It's about going back to what we really care about from wherever it comes from and building upon that and learning that you know, a life of collecting is a lot more exciting than a life of just buying. So is it challenging times right now? Oh yes, it is extremely, extremely challenging times. But I think that you know, conservative thinking leads to conservative results. So you can be in the box if you want. And 99.99% .99 of the people will be in the box because there is a formula to the box. And people will tell you this is the way you have to do it and this is the way you, you shouldn't do it. But I think that when you're out of the box is when you can create your new box. And that today will make a lot of sense. Um, I think that you know, opportunities are in your mind and opportunities are things that you develop over time. And everything that you do along the way will create for you a learning, um, a, learning to, uh, a learning to understand something new, something different, and how to utilize something that can truly affect differently what others are doing. And I think the word differently is really important because in sameness, you get a sea of nothing. And I think that um, that's really what I have to, to leave you with today. Um, and I'm completely open to any questions you have. And I know I talked all over the place and I hope that some of the things I've said have uh, <laughs> meant something. Does anybody have any questions for me? Yeah. Um, we send it out to customers. We have our own customer database. We've been doing this for 10 years now. So over the course of the 10 years, we have built both what is called acquisition strategy, which is you know from partnering and doing list mining and all that to cultivating our own customers. If you don't get a catalog because you're not on what we call the circulation list, then you will um, go online or call and you can receive a catalog. We actually have priced them now at $10 and that's just more of a control mechanism but also because there is a value that will be credited back to you once you purchase. We ch we do, I mean, every single issue that we do is entirely new, e except for what we can consider the very Vive classics, which today only represent about 25% of our collection. Um, so every issue really functions like a magazine and is entirely new. So it's collaborations with artists, it's finding people around the world, it's editing new lines, it's constant. It's absolutely constant, and yes, we do. We, we are consistently looking and we're across categories so we're not we're not about fashion we're really about style we're really about your lifestyle we're really about a way of life um, and we bridge all of that and we will find interesting people I went to Peru last year and I developed a lot of products with local artists that we brought back we found amazing jewelry makers we found some very interesting cultural things we did a whole story on Peru we brought that forward um, it it changes all the time and we're spanning the I mean we travel all the time to all different places and work with people we work with big brands here and collaborate on unique products we work with with artists it's endless I mean and that's really the my opinion the really fundamental difference 
um, in what it is that we do. And some of the things may be a, a store that I bump into. You'll see in here, there's a store I found in LA that um, I, I loved, which is a rare uh, books. It has very unique books, and each of the books is, is signed. Well, I mean, there's only one of the books, but I felt like it was important to tell people about it, and if they wanted to get these books, they could go, and they could find the store. Or this woman who used to be, um, who used to be a um, party organizer and opened this store where she creates out of floral arrangements these sculptures that are absolutely unbelievable. I mean, there are these floral sculptures that are, I, I mean, I think are works of art. So we created three unique sculptures with her, that are now being sold through Viv. Go ahead. We do over a million and a half issues a year. So it's four different, it's four different issues, um, and then the, the cross distribution across those four issues is about a million and a half. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you know, I think that everything in life is a process, right? So it starts with you. So if you're really passionate about something, and you tell, you tell me, for example, you know what, Ava, I love to go to these particular stores on these days, or I like to go to this market, because I know that when I go there on X day, I can find incredible coral, incredible whatever it is. You start to communicate that then all of a sudden I get excited because I'm like, oh my God, let's go and let's find it. It's the same thing in what you're doing, right? When people talk about places like, let's just take a store. You know, the other day I heard some news that really, really upset me. One of my favorite little specialty stores in New York is called Linda Dresner. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but she's been in New York for 25 years and she's got kind of like a very unusual eye, a, a very um, sharp eye, but she's closing, right? So for me, the fact that Linda Dresner, I mean, she's closing not for any you know, she's 70 and her lease has just gone up and she has a store in Michigan. But that store was Linda. And what it meant was it wasn't going to be everything that you found everywhere else. You're always going to find some different brands. You're always going to find a point of view in her jewelry. You know, it was eclectic. It was changed up. Moss. When you think about Moss and you think about his ideas, how did he communicate his difference? I mean, you walk in there and you know that you're feeling as stimulated about collecting whatever it is than you are about buying, right? And if you look at the other extreme of it, right? I'm going to look at the other extreme. Let's talk about J. Crew for a second. I mean, look at what they've done with J. Crew by exactly trying to do that, right? They've brought emotion into it, they've brought mood into it, they've elevated it by saying, you know what, you're going to get great Italian cashmere, we're using Loro Piana fabric, take a look at your Globetrotter luggage. They've created a whole world around that which makes you feel like, all right, well, in the end, I'm not just buying this whatever, even though the result may be that. So I think so much of it is done by your approach, your belief, and that's why it goes back to soul. Then you can communicate it. I mean, somebody who wants to buy the five sweater versus the one sweater, you know, at the end of the day, you can't change the world. But by you doing what you do well and by being consistent, you will convert. You had a question? Banks? Oh, we work with, I mean, we work with almost... We've worked with almost everybody. I mean, right now we work with, you know, Michael Kors, Oscar Renta. I mean, you all, uh, Cavalli, um, Etro. I mean, most of the big brands, but what we do is we curate their collections, right? 
So now what, we, what we're on a mission of is we're all, we have a, a section in our, in our book called Style Makers. So we always try to find somebody who's different, somebody who's new, somebody who has, we haven't heard of. And what we look at is we look at style makers in different categories. So people who are in fashion, people who are in home, people who are in design. We always have artists. I'm a big believer in the idea of art and, and design come together. I'm a big believer in what is great in terms of architecture. Fundamentally will be great in terms of furniture. Um, and taking things and turning them on their heads. So, you know, we worked with, we collaborated with somebody who's a very good uh, with crocodile skins. And we decided that instead of doing really handbags and things like that, we were going to make jewelry. But instead of making cuffs out of real crocodile, which other people have done, we've actually, we took the crocodile skin and we casted it. So the, the whole idea is that there is just so much. And if you can really understand the reason why, and if you believe enough in the reason why, you can communicate that. And I'm also a big believer in simplicity. I mean, price never matters. You can have the most amazing thing at $50, and you can have the most amazing thing at $10,000. Right? There's a lot of non-amazing in between, but it doesn't really matter. You had a question? So let me answer your first question, um, which was about the fact that you can't touch it. I disagree with you, right? If I read an incredible book, I can close my eyes and escape anywhere I want. If I look at an incredible magazine, I can do the same. So this is just a medium, right? This is a storytelling medium. I don't know if you've seen our catalog. So just because it's on paper, I actually think that we can, we can romance because when you go into a lot of stores today, I can't think of a store today in New York that I truly love. I've, I'm missing the magic. The worst thing about it is the salespeople. They don't even know what they're selling, right? Now, having said all that, that doesn't mean that I wouldn't love to have a store too. But I don't think that, that because you're using one method over another method, I think it's the way you approach that method and what you expect out of yourself. Now, on the answer of the million and a half, I think that I'm going to answer two ways for you. First of all, if you divide that by four, right, compared to any other catalog circulation, it's minuscule. Because you take a front gate, for example, you're talking about 40 million. You take J. Crew, you're talking about 60 million. I mean, they're all in the millions. We're minuscule. But I think that I'm going to um, go back to what you said and say, yes, that is the challenge, right? The challenge is how do you, how do you take a concept which is um, about understanding and belief and how do you make that accessible. So then I say, take a look at some brands that have done that well, right? So take a look at like an Hermes, right? Do you believe that they have craftsmanship? Do you believe they have know-how? Take a look at a Baccarat. Do they know how to have a special skill set? Um, and et cetera, et cetera. So I do think it's possible. I do think that it's a challenge because you have to regulate like how much you do and how much you can't do. But the other thing is, you also don't want everything to be one note. There could also be beautiful stationery that's, you know, that's designed here and that's just fun. But the idea is there's a reason for it. So it is challenging to do something special and figure out how, how big you can expand it. But this is, the, the world is big. So we may, we may not be able to go deep because we'll never be able to go deep, but we can go wide. Does that answer it? Can you have to be my last question? That's that's my fault. <laughs> we should fix that. 
how do we make our profit? Well, we're, you know, we, are, we work on a couple of different mechanisms. One is we work on marketing revenues and fees. And the second is we work on margin. And um, you know, we, we create some of our own product. A lot of it's exclusive. So we have pretty, you know, we have pretty standard you know, operating margins. Well, what's in the book, we sell. Yeah, we have a team. We have a whole merchandising team, not a buyer team. Yeah. You know, the way we look at it is we don't, we don't view our catalogs as a catalog. We view our catalogs as a point in time and a marketing tool. So, of course, when the catalog comes out, you know, the business goes up substantially. But what we really measure is phone versus internet. And of course, more and more people are ordering online because it's just a method that's being more and more comfortable for them. But this is inducing them. It's like when you get a magazine and you all of a sudden you find something you like and you go out to the store versus just saying, let me go cruising around the internet to buy something. No. We don't do any wholesale. We're thinking about that because we've just, you know, sort of, our line has just begun to get developed, but um, we haven't done that yet. Um, we've been asked quite a few times, and we're beginning to think about if that were an approach, what would be the right approach. Thank you so much, and I wish you fantastic uh, Thanksgiving. Thank you.